Well, g'day and welcome back to episode 4 of the Stuart No. 8 mill engine build. In this episode we're going to take a look at the flywheel which is a fairly straightforward cast iron part. It was going to be included in the previous video but the crankshaft just took so long that there wasn't enough room to include that. So we're going to have a look at it now, even though you've probably seen what it looks like as a finished machine part. We're going to go back to the start through the magic of television. So let's go back, 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 back. Okay, so this is the setup I'm using to machine the flywheel. Uh, I've got the three-jaw chuck expanded against what is effectively this surface here on the other side of the flywheel. I'm doing it this way because that allows me to machine the outer diameter of the rim. I can do all my facing operations here. I can center drill, drill and ream all in one setting. And that means that all of those features are correct relative to each other. When I turn it round, all I need to do is grip it by the rim using the outer diameter. And I'll probably use a four-jaw chuck to do that and, and clock it in. And then all I have to do is machine the, or face the other side and do a little bit of chamfering. So it's not the most rigid setup. I'll probably center drill and hold this in place with the tailstock center. Just while I do the, the outer diameter and the facing operation here then I can carefully drill out and ream and all that sort of stuff so if it's going to move I want it to move while I'm doing these features here um, that way I've got room to go I can correct it uh, once you drill and ream that bore everything else sort of rides on how accurate that is so let's give it a go That's what cast iron does to high speed steel tooling. So that's just worn the edge right off that. I might switch over to carbide I think. That's better. Okay, so I just clean that up. We'll do this out at iron here and then we'll get a few measurements on it. One of the things that you'll read about cast iron is that you should try and get right under the skin of the cast iron in your first cut. Uh, the skin is quite abrasive and you saw what it did to my high speed steel tool. Um, and I, I would take a much heavier cut if I could be sure that this setup was rigid enough. Um, just a bit worried about it moving in the chuck, that's why I'm sort of going, going a bit easy with it. We'll do one more cut here and then we'll get our dimension on it. a chatter pattern in that which is a fairly good indication that we don't really have a, a really strong grip on that part okay 91.97 let's work out what that is in American inches all right drawing shows three and Three and nine, uh, yeah, three and nine sixteenths an inch. So let's work out what that is. Okay, we're looking at ninety point four eight millimeters for that outer diameter there. So I'm going to set my caliper to that. So I've got about one point four eight to come off. One point four six. Okay, so that should be the outer diameter done now. What we'll do now is just uh, machine off this rim here. 
and then I can get rid of the centre and go from there. Alright, so this rim's about two millimetres too wide at the moment. So if I take a millimetre off this side and a mill off the other side, we'll be roughly in the centre of the casting. So we just um, bring the tool up to there. I'll set my DRO. What I really need to do now is machine the center hub to the same setting. I just face it off to the same setting. So I'm going to have to remove the tail stock here. It's taken care of that. Um, I do need to drill and ream the center of the hub now. Alright, just drill that through at 6.2 millimeters. Uh, and it's got to be bored at 5 sixteenths. And I remember reading somewhere that you can't be sure that a drill bit's going to run concentric and a reamer will not correct a hole that's not concentric either. So the advice that I was given there was that you should always bore close to your finished size and then use your reamer just to clean it up and size it. I have got a little tiny boring bar that I can put in there but I might come a bit closer to size so we'll go to say 7.5. Right so what I'll do is I'm going to put a very small boring bar through there. So this little uh, boring bar is really going to be just to get me close to my correct size hole and to make sure that the hole at this point is concentric. So I'm not going to be removing a lot of material here. Okay, I'll do some chamfers and then we're done on this side. Okay, so that takes care of that side. All I need now is flip that over and machine the other face and chamfer there and we're done. Okay, I'll just um, I've clocked that in on the four jaw chuck there and I'm just giving it a tap. That's probably a hundredth of a mil out. I'll tweak that a little bit until I'm happy with it and then we'll just go ahead and machine that face. Okay, well, the drawing shows a measurement of 23.30 seconds. I mean, really? 23.30 seconds? I don't know who comes up with these stupid measurements. Anyway, um, convert that to metric and we're about one 1.02 millimeters over the sides. All right, so that's the width of the wheel taken care of. So we're just going to do a few chamfers now to finish off. Okay, finished flywheel. Later on I'm going to powder coat all of this and I may have to put it back on a mandrel just to do a final polish on it to remove the powder coat from the, the rim. And that's why I've left that finish as it is. It's sort of not, not perfect but I'll clean it up later. So the, the final thing to be done now is there's got to be a grub screw hole drilled through on a slight angle clamp the flywheel to the crankshaft and there you go, finished flywheel. Uh, one of the last processes I need to carry out on this flywheel is to drill a grub screw hole in the boss to hold the flywheel to the crankshaft. Uh, what I've done is I've just
put this back in the four jaw chuck and align that. I've used a engineer square just to eyeball the spokes so that I've got the spokes vertical. And I've got a, a rig set up in my compound slide which allows me to drill exactly on centre height with this board hole and at 10 degrees off uh, the centre line of the, the flywheel. So I've positioned my spotting drill where I want the uh, 5BA tapped hole to be. Drawings don't specify exactly where it needs to go and I've just got some clearance on the flywheel rim. So this is just a, an old AEG two-speed drill uh, mounted in a fixture on the compound slide and uh, I've used this setup before in some of my videos and it's really good because it allows you to leave the job in the lathe and do cross drilling operations and face drilling operations without disturbing the work. So um, I'm going to go ahead and spot this hole and then we'll drill through and then we'll tap it. So I need to swap out now for a, a number 37 drill bit, which is tapping size for 5BA. Got a little bit more reach with this drill bit, so it should be fine. Alright, so what I need to do now is get that 5BA tap in there and uh, cut that thread. I might just see if I can get it started using this rig. No, not quite enough reach, but I've, I've just got it started anyway. Um, and I'll be able to take that out just use a, a normal tap wrench to drive that in. I just, um, when you're doing this in the lathe, I just took the, uh, the gearbox of the electric drill out of gear. So you get a better feel of what's going on. You can see the tap already started there. Okay, so um, I might just deburr this, uh, this hole, uh, chamfer the inside of the hole anyway, before I go ahead and finish off that tapped hole. And then uh, essentially that flywheel is done. Okay, so that's done. So I'm just going to put this aside now until it's been powder coated and then I'll put it back on the lathe, clean up the rim and the outer surface of the wheel. Ah, another one down. Okay, so that takes care of the flywheel. So let's move on. Let's take a look, see what else is in the box. Alright, so what we've got is the cylinder, the valve chest, the valve chest cover, the cylinder bottom cover, and the cylinder top cover. I'm going to begin by machining the cylinder and then fit all of these parts to it. I've already checked on the internet and there are literally dozens and dozens of videos and sites which show you how to make a model steam engine cylinder or how to go about that machining process. The thing is though, they're all different. It really does depend on what sort of equipment you have available to do this job. For someone who has just a lathe, it's possible to machine all of that cylinder on a lathe and perhaps say a drilling machine. It's slightly different if you own a milling machine because some of the flat surfaces can be done on that. I'm going to be making use of my metal lathe, my manual mill and the CNC mill for doing all of the machining operations on this and all of the other parts. The process is going to begin with the cylinder itself and we're going to bore the cylinder uh, on the lathe and we're going to machine this single face here and they will become the references for all of the other parts that we're going to do. You might be wondering where the piston is. I'm going to leave that till later. I'm going to get all of these parts uh, machined and fitted together and then I'll worry about all of the moving parts and they will be things like the piston, the eccentric, the slide valve, crosshead and so on. So let's begin on the lathe and head over there and see how this is going to work. Okay, the, uh, the technique I'm going to show you here is not something I invented. This is um, something I saw a bloke named Keith Appleton doing, who's a fairly prolific YouTuber who uh, deals mainly with model engineering. His method for setting up a cast iron cylinder casting in a four-door chuck for machining the face and boring is to first of all make a spigot. I've made this one out of light alloy 
it's a loose-ish sort of fit in the bore uh, and of course that, that bore is not accurate, it's just um, cored in. I did clean it out with a file just to remove any um, roughness on the inside of the casting. That's why the spigot's not a, a really precision fit and the other end fits into your tail stock chuck and you can then slide the tail stock up close to the chuck and position it in your four door chuck. Now I've already set this up and loosened it again which is why it appears to be going very simply and very easily. Uh, and then it's just a matter of lightly closing the chuck jaws onto the casting. And tightening all the, all the way around and checking it. And of course the idea is that the spigot aligns the cord section of the casting with the axis of your lathe. And you know often these cord uh, sections in the casting aren't accurate. They can, they can be misaligned with the axis of the casting itself. And I guess it's just a quick way of setting it up. You could just do it by eye. You, can, you can't really put a, a dial indicator inside there because it's so rough. And I'm using the biggest of my four jaw chucks here, so it sort of copes fairly easily with this casting. It's actually bearing on the flat surface on where the slide valve will operate. There's a, a lug or a boss where one of the um, fittings will go later on. There's another one underneath, so it's actually bearing on some fairly large areas. In the version of the video that I saw Keith Appleton did, he put a piece of thick uh, packing under this jaw and this one, so it was actually gripping on the, the barrel of the casting itself. I don't think I need to do that. I think it's going to go quite well. Once you've got all that aligned, you can take your um, tail sock out the way. I'll just turn that on so you can see how, how that's running. That's pretty close. And what I can do now is to face that end and bore the casting. And that'll give me enough reference surfaces to do the rest of the machining. Okay, let's clean that up and uh, anybody who's done this before will tell you to get under the skin of the casting and make sure you remove all of that cast layer. I'll just check the length of this casting. Okay, I have to do a bit of maths here um, before I go any further. On the drawing, it didn't actually show the total distance across all of these three ports here. I've worked it out at 9 sixteenths and the total length of this finished cylinder has to be an inch and 9 sixteenths, which means there should be a half an inch left at either end. Now the reason I'm doing all of that is because I've already cleaned up this face here and if I were to just leave it and then turn it around and do the other end, I could wind up in a situation where I'm not going to be able to get the port machined inside this cord area with the required half an inch left here. So according to my rule, um, I've got, uh, what's that? I'm about a 30 second of an inch over where I should be. So that's, what's that, 17, 30 seconds. So I've got to take off that much, uh, which should leave me, by the time I machine it to an inch and nine sixteenths, with the right length at the other end, I hope. So I'm going to take off the one thirty second now, and then we'll bore the hole. Okay, so... We're about, I don't know, 330 seconds too long, but don't forget I haven't cleaned up the other end. And all right, I've got my half an inch, give or take, to the edge of that first port. And that finish is pretty good, so we'll, we'll go ahead and bore that. Okay, so I've got my comedy sized boring bar set up, and I just did a test cut 
to make sure I was going to clear it's it's just going to clear the body of the, the boring bar so I'll run that through we've got to finish it an inch diameter I've got a an adjustable reamer which we're going to use to finish it so um, let's get rid of the cord section and uh, we'll get a dimension on that and we'll go from there Okay, so I won't show you all of this, so I'll uh, get it close to size and we'll finish it with the reamer. Okay, I'm getting 25.315 and we want to go 25.4 so I'm going to stop using the boring tool there and we'll swap over to a reamer. Okay, so this is my spanning reamer, engineer's best friend I call this. But um, what I've done here is I've just messed around with this until it's just sort of passing through um, and then I'll run this under power and just gradually increase it and check it as I go. Uh, what I didn't want to do was have this set wrongly and push it through and then find out that I was um, oversized on the bore. So I'm going to run this at low speed. certainly cut so that should put us close right, 25.35 yep shooting for 25.4 Probably somebody really clever that's worked out how many turns you need to put these nuts to give you a specific increase in size. Well, there you go, it's, have a look at that, <laughs> 25.4 exactly, okay, got to get lucky sometimes, okay, so I'm going to just break that edge now, and I can take that out, and we'll machine off the, the flat where the slide bar is going to go. Okay, so that's the end I've already machined with the chamfered edge there. The ball looks pretty good. Um, I've got a little, one of those little uh, brake cylinder hones which I might run through there. You've probably heard it chattering. And uh, that would have left a few little marks and ridges, but actually it looks pretty good. But I'll, yeah, certainly I think I'll just give that a light hone. So now that we have a flat surface and a true accurate bore all done at the same setting, we're going to use that flat surface to do basically everything else uh, from now on. Now this surface which I'm about to sheen off, according to the drawings, it should be a total of 7 eighths of an inch from the bore center to that flat surface there. So knowing that that has to be 3 eighths of an inch from the 
uh, inside of the board to that flat surface there. I've just set my dividers to 3 8 I've scribed a line and I've centre punched that. So that little centre punch mark there is my only reference uh, and I'll machine back until I hit that mark. Uh, in reality, I'm not sure how important this dimension is. It's not really going to affect much in terms of the operation of the engine. Um, the slide valve is connected to the rotating part of the engine with the eccentric strap anyway, so or the eccentric rod. So there's a little bit of misalignment here, it doesn't really matter, but just to keep my good friend Keith happy, I have to be very, very precise. So I'm just going to lock that down. And this is going to go on the table of the mill and I'll machine that surface here and that will at least ensure that that surface is perpendicular to the end of the cylinder that I've already machined in the lathe. Okay, so here's the, the general setup on the milling machine. So my angle plate's bolted down at the bed of the mill. I have squared the angle plate to the bed of the mill, but there's probably no need. I could, after I've machined this flat surface here, also machine the ports. And that then it would make sense to have the angle plate squared to the bed of the, the mill. I'm not going to do it on this manual mill, I'm going to do the ports in the CNC machine, so I'll have to set this up again later, but uh, that shouldn't be a problem. So all I'm going to do here now is to skim that um, cast surface there and bring it back to the mark that I've already put on the, the unmachined end. So I'm using a uh, three insert cutter and uh, we're going to run this at moderate speed across there, just manually, I don't have any auto feed on this machine. Okay, well that surface finish wasn't brilliant. Uh, I think this setup's got a bit of flexibility and my milling head is a homemade system so the rigidity here is not the best. I've swapped out for a 5 insert cutter with slightly more rake and uh, I think this will do a better job. Yeah, that's better. So that just needs a light roll on some emery cloth on a, on a flat piece of glass so I've got uh, to get that truly flat and polished smooth. So I'll leave that. So we've now got two reference surfaces we can work from. Getting better all the time. I just went and gave that material a, a bit of a polish on a surface plate with some very fine emery cloth and I think I now know why that cutter had such a hard time. There's a a mottled pattern all the way through this material and definitely around the ports where it looks like the cast iron is chilled which means that uh, as it cooled it um, solidified too quickly and that material has gone rock hard or glass hard and there's a, there's a definite mottled pattern to that surface there. I could be wrong but um, we got it done and it's not going to affect the performance of the engine at all. Could mean that cutting those ports is going to be fun. And I've only got high speed steel tooling to do that, so I might have to get some carbide if that does prove to be chilled. Fun times. Next uh, thing I have to do is to be able to machine this end of the cylinder. So we've done this end, we've done the port face, and I want to be able to get this accurate and perpendicular to the bore. So all I've done here is I've set up a piece of 25.4 uh, or 1 inch diameter bar stock in the four jaw chuck and I've clocked that true and I'm just going to stick it together with some CA glue. I 
I think that probably the right way to do this would be to make an expanding mandrel. But being a lazy ass, so I just decided that this is going to be uh, quick and easy. And my biggest issue is going to be, can I get that out of there again? I arranged that so I can get my micrometer into the gap between the jaws so I can measure that face as I start to machine it down and it seems like that's basically set already so um, I'm just going to give that a little while to cure and then I'll machine that face, check the length uh, chamfer that edge and uh, we're pretty much done I'll have to bore some holes through here for the uh, drain valves and of course uh, we'll have to machine the exhaust port and clean up the inlet ports. Okay, I'm going to be using high speed steel tooling for this. Um, I want to take very light cuts so I'm not entirely convinced how strong this bond is. So I'm just going to take it very slow, get under the skin and then I'll just gradually bring that back to its correct length. cleaned up nicely. Um, the reason I said I didn't want to use uh, carbide and I'm using high speed steel is that carbide tools require a lot more cutting pressure to get good results. Um, if you're just taking light cuts they tend to um, exert too much pressure on the job so I think high speed steel is probably the best choice here. So I'm going to get the micrometer on that, work out the difference and then I'll just gradually bring that back to the correct size. That was easier than I thought. Alright, well we've reached the end of part four. I'm going to wind this video up now. It's got to about half an hour length, which is uh, about the limit of what I like to post. In the next episode, we're going to look at uh, machining the steam chest, uh, the steam chest cover and the cylinder covers. So for now, we're going to wind this up and thanks for watching.